So they went afterwards, you know, the Ackermans, uh, kids, and so on. So I said, here's a simple thing to deal with intergenerational poverty. Why does a smart kid get stuck in Kailicha or in other fields and never get out of there? Education. So why don't you guys put together a substantial fund with wraparound support that enables a child to get into your grade 8 class or whatever grade they want to do better and take that kid through? And the impact on that family, okay, will be so huge. Let me give you an example of this. Sinukoro Dilichana went to the worst school in South Africa, it's called Oscar Peta High School in Nayaka. It's next to a taxi rank. A lot of those kids die right there. He gets 100% in history. The sub examiner for history in grade 12 is at St. Cyprian. She says, I'm not supposed to tell you about this kid. Okay, got 100% history. No other kid in the, in the Cape in that year got 100% history. So I went to the Facebook group and I said, uh, excuse me sir, I hear you've got 100% history. What are you doing right now? I'm on my way. He says, I'm on my way to, um, this is somebody who was timing my talk. Um, <laughs> he says, I'm on my way to Golden Era to become a bastard. I said, you can't go to Golden Meadow. Would you mind going back home and pack your bags and there will be a, uh, a ticket waiting for you at the Cape Town station. You come to Bloomfield Bank after you out of the airport at the bus station, sorry, and uh, the Grand Bus Station, and I'll bring you on the him and a kid from Delft that we were supporting, and they started their first year. The rest of the three states are under than 14 years old this year. It has never had a fully stocked library in one of its residences. He built that. He wrote to every publisher. So when the kids came home from St. Law or Medicine or Teacher Education, 
they could come and have this one. He then takes his mother out of the shack with his first job and puts him in a decent house. He then decides that because, oh, by the way, can I just test this on you? Anybody here have a guess as to why he got 100% in a very dysfunctional school? Mother was a teacher. You get this right, and I will <laughs> give you all of my books. <coughs> Mother was a teacher, no? Your mother was poor. She worked at Cape Town Airport. She didn't even know. Did he get a teacher? Yeah. I'm so sorry for you, xenophobic <laughs> <laughs> Sonata. <laughs> but his teacher was from Zimbabwe. Do you know why Zimbabwe has better schools than us? 1954. The day we took the South African schools away from the churches and gave it to the garden, that's the day the schools were there. Zimbabwe, for some strange reason, kept their schools under the Anglican and the Catholic, mainly as a war And they didn't shout colonial at everything that they saw. They kept the most colonial of assessment systems for the British over and Alien syndicates. And have the best school. So his teacher was in the car. Later, I see he calls me and says, Professor, I just wanted you to be the first student. I haven't even told my mother yet. I just won the Mandela Rhodes Scholarship to do a master's in the teaching of So he is now going to train a Eureka. Hundreds of kids every day in the teaching of history. Think of the uh, multiplication here, the effect. Rolling off. Think of the family's domestic economy that <coughs> changes immediately. Think of the fact that his other siblings can now also go to university. That's why I'm saying the best way to do this is through education. Okay? And if you put together with the resources that you have, and by the way, I'll, <coughs> I'm going to do, I'll do a fundraiser, I'm doing it for some other schools. And Tuli, Madisella, and I will do a joint show, and we bring some fairly well technical together, and we raise the money to get you going. If you can put 20, 30 kids, and you do away with the stupid thing that some of these white schools, former white schools, do called sibling policy. The sibling is a bloody stupid kid, but just because he's a brother. That's all privilege. That's not called meritocracy. Mm -hmm. It's a top pretending it's meritocracy. It's privilege. Heritage! My grandmother went to the school, so what? <laughs> But the effect of that, the downside of that, is very few can get in. So why don't you change that policy for three years and you say, you know what? We are going to create spaces for it. And that's how the Western Cape doesn't have it. If you want to tell me, why do people look at the Western Cape and tell us about this? You know what? Because unlike our thing, we don't have a large black African middle class. We don't. I go to any restaurant in, in Johannesburg and you see a whole lot of black middle class people. You come here and you see people like you and me. That's it. So if you want to make a long term effect, one thing, build a substantial war chest to give a high quality education which your school does give to kids who don't look like you and you begin to show the promise of this. Country. Next question. Sir? I just want to ask one question. Do you think the closing down of the colleges of education in South Africa was a good idea from the government? That question I get a lot, and there's two answers to that. Yes, it was a bad idea, depending on which college you're talking about. So if you're talking at the homeland colleges, that is the colleges in Kanakua, the colleges in uh, Ulundi, and so on. We had very good research, and I'm happy to share it with you, by Cecily Salmon and, and one other person who's never forget, Wood, that showed that those colleges were really just places for kids to blow up steam while they waited to be absorbed into the economy. It was the worst. That's why you see a lot of the teaching that we have today is people in their 50s and 60s who went to the economy. So the colleges, they were for people <coughs> who wanted to become teachers. They were really for people who didn't have another way of getting a bursary and being able to support the family. And as I said, university. But if you're talking about the Army College of Education, of course that was a bad idea. If you're talking about Jarvisville College of Education, that was a bad idea. If you're talking about Global Teachers College to the UN, that was a bad idea. So there were spotted places in which you had really good <coughs> and let me just be honest with you saying, the worst place to, to train primary school teachers is the university. 
I would never train a primary school teacher to do any of this. They're the worst person. They teach high school kids, FET. Okay? And so if I want to learn civil education, one of the first things I would do is bring my colleagues of education, but in a particular way. Not just build it, but make sure you <coughs> get the best teachers, college teachers, college lecturers, <coughs> to train these young people how to become primary school. So the answer is yes, it was a bad idea, but not in all cases. Yeah. Now. Look, I'm an, I'm an <coughs> just like your mother. Ah. I don't know how you can say to for exactly the same thing. Because um, currently I'm in a six estate and old age home, and we are dealing with these wonderful carers who are working for us with the greatest desire to get, to become nurses. But it is so expensive. And if I mean the days when I trained it was that same thing. You actually you were you were paid while you were learning. We had I trained at Tartar Hospital for instance, I'm with Afrikaans doing this daughter, but anyway. But to cut the long story short, it is we are missing that. There is such a need in this country for good nurses, the same thing as for good teachers, and if we can bring back nursing colleges, it would also be fantastic. No, I agree. <coughs> and, and you know, with both nursing and teaching, uh, because they're so similar as professionals, uh, the, the, the underlying problem is not structure. The underlying problem is attitude. So how do you begin to bring into, uh, can we just talk about what I know, into a school, into a school, the kind of passion for the job? I'm going to be doing a, a fundraiser also for the hospice and the hospice. You know what? I've never seen such love, such care, mm -hmm. such incredible love. For people who are little kids, they are. This is to my friend just died, John Flanders. And I went in there to say goodbye to him, and there was a total stranger just rubbing my feet. You see, that is lost in, in school. If you go to the University of Stanford right now, you know who the only kids are? <coughs> who are studying teaching. Why have you gone to this? You won't find a lot of black kids. You know why? Because for 12 years they saw crap. Whereas the white kids went to schools in which, when I asked them every year in survey, why would you like them on a race restaurant? The answer is the same every single year. My crowd three, my crowd star, cross up. My crowd see everything else on the way. So they turn to a specific teacher. And you cross that path. <laughs> started to read all the parables in the Bible. Just for fun. And there's one that really bothers me. It's this stupid guy. He appears in two Gospels. He's wrongly called in ordinary, and he falls in love. He's wrongly called the Good Shepherd. Do you know what does he do? What did he do? Yeah. You know, you know, I didn't even ask the question. Are you like Jewish or something? Yeah. <laughs> Who's <laughs> 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 this guy? He's got 99 sheep, right? I've only made a story here because of my things. He's got 99 sheep. You know the story? Yeah, yeah, you know the story, sir. He's got 99 sheep, right? What is a good and one sheep goes they want? That's what I was to tell you. What is a good action to do under those circumstances? A good action? Yeah. The good actually, thank you so much for coming. The good actually says, I have 99. Let me keep them safe from the predators, from the elements. And that's what the good actually does. And what does it do with the other one? Bad debt. <laughs> you write it off. Except this guy, this idiot, he does the opposite of common sense. He leaves the 99. He goes to look for the one. <laughs> and what happens when he finds it? Where is the man? He celebrates. <laughs> well, I think so. Thank you so much. The guy celebrates. He picks up the sheep, puts it on his shoulders. And it says he's happy. <laughs> In fact, it uses the old word he rejoices. Because he found the sheep that was 
us. Why is this country intuitive about the Cape Flats? <laughs> <laughs> because if a kid goes AWOL in Blue Root Mall, and the brother finds the kid, there he is no greater rejoicing. <laughs> 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 There's no rejoicing, but he rejoices. And then he takes the sheep, and where does he go next, sir? Anybody? You went to and invite the neighbors to come and join. Thank you, sir. You obviously read your Bible. The first people say, get to another sheep. By the way. <laughs> I can tell the story the other day in Parkwood, and I asked, I made a huge mistake to ask a Muslim woman, and what did he do with the sheep? And she said, let's laugh over the other side. Last question. Brilliant. Um, in changing the, the, the nation to education, I'd like to just put in one it was an acronym, and I'd, I'd really like to hear your, your thinking of the power of SATU and how does SATU work within the shifting of our nation through education? Okay. So I'm a liberal, right? Not a liberal in the South African sense, but a liberal in the global sense, in that I do believe in unions. I really do believe it's good for a democracy to have strong future unions or any kind of Let me just say that. The second thing I want to say is, the ethics of such, let me just continue this thing, is such that if you are a teacher and you put your kid in the code, and then you go back to Google it, and you then become part of the group that disturbs and disrupts the school and breaks away halfway through the day. I'm not making this up. You go to a certain meeting. That's unfair. That's wrong. You can't take your own kid and ensconce that kid in a wonderful environment and then you disrupt. Some of these so called lefties at UCT, they're not real lefties. These are professors who encourage the students to burn their artworks, which to electronically put. But they had rusted the girls as parents, one of the most untransformed schools, and they do nothing about it. I'm sorry, this is hypocrisy. Okay? When you take care of your own and you disrupt the lives of others, it doesn't work in my book. <coughs> the ethics of the shepherd suggests I don't dress until everybody. Now, it might be idealistic, it might be utopian thinking, but I tell you what, I'm not going to stop with the bread that I have until I see every child succeed, regardless of who they are, regardless of how much their parents earn. That, I think, is our commitment. That's how this country, this country will not, I'm not even going to vote on this, let me tell you something, it's a waste of time. Okay. If I'm going to vote for anybody, it's for the ATM, because at least their name is suggested, you know? <laughs> and I don't have these idealistic views about democracy and so on and so forth, because the very people who get screwed by the ANC are the people who vote for them. And by the way, it will be in the record now, mm -hmm. since the last election at least. So I don't get that, you know? Um, but what I do know is what keeps this country together is not parliament. Mm -hmm. What keeps us coming together is people like you. And that gives me hope. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.